today, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, underwriting sheets. Um, and I guess when we built ours, we built it very conservatively um, because we're very conservative. Um, and, you know, the numbers tell a story. Um, but unfortunately, you can also make the numbers like statistics, right? You can make them say anything that you basically want. So we wanted to make sure that if someone used our underwriting sheet, um, it would give them a conservative estimate to move forward with, because sometimes you can just, you know, mess around with stuff or whatever it is, and you're like, oh, this is a great deal. And then you actually, you know, go and look at it. It's like, wow, this is a really bad deal. Um, so you just want to make sure that you use it properly. So it's about 635. So let's just start right now. Um, let's just do this. And all right, so this is a little small, so you guys are gonna have to help me out. Can you guys can you see this? Is it too small? Yeah, can yeah, see can it. See it right? No, I can okay. see it pretty good. Mm -hmm. So this is the spreadsheet that we built, right? So this is the 2023 version. Um we um we're we're on version nine right now, and then in a couple of months we'll be on version 10. Um, but the first part um, is something you've all probably heard about, which is the sniff test, right? 10 minutes, look at a property, know if it's even worth your time to go and underwrite it, because it's probably going to take you about an hour to underwrite a deal. Um, and if you look at 10 deals, that's 10 hours. So why not do something quick where you can find out in about 10 minutes if a deal is even worth exploring? And if it is, then you take it to the next step, right? So this is kind of down and dirty, back of the envelope kind of thing. Um, and Nicole started this um, years and years ago, um, again, on paper. <laughs> so we changed it to a spreadsheet. So, um, and I just put an example up here. We're gonna use the same example all the way through. It's a small building, um, it's 10 units, right? The asking price is $850,000. And uh, the price per unit, right? It does the math for you, is 85,000. And the rent is about $1,000 per unit. So if you add it all together, you get your monthly rent roll, $10,000. So when you look at a property, you have to get this information, what their monthly rent roll is, how many units and what they're asking. And most brokers uh, now, they didn't used to, but now will give it to you because the market's changed quite a bit with interest rates kind of going through the roof. Um, and now people aren't just getting whatever they want. You know, sky's the limit. People are starting to get a little bit more realistic. Um, and it's going back to the way it was before all the craziness. Um, and, you know, to 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 kind of thing. So um, what it'll do for you is it'll say, what's the annualized income? So again, trying to make this very easy. So what we did here was um, 120,000 is gross income, right? It's basically um, $10,000 times 12. We always put in um, a vacancy percentage of 10. Um, if someone tells you that their building is 100% occupied, um, I would take it with a grain of salt because um, one of two things are happening. Um, I would be shocked if all of the people in that building are actually paying every month because there's always one or two people they get behind or whatever it is, they can't pay. Um, so you've got bad debt. Uh, sometimes when you're trying to bring people in, you may give a discount. So this 10% is uh, physical vacancy. So apartments that are actually empty, right? economic vacancy, so people that have not paid. And if you have to get concessions to anyone in terms of, hey, I'll give you a month free to move in, which we've done a lot of our properties. If you add that all together, it's about 10%. Some people use five, but you know, you can hear me say this like 10,000 times. We're like very, very conservative. So the vacancy amount is 12,000. So your effective gross income is 108, right? So top line income effective is gonna be 108. Expenses is usually about 45% or whatever this number is. Um, and that comes out to 48.6. And then, so this will actually spit it out for you in terms of, is this worth you know taking a look at or not? So the NOI on this property is 59.4, right? Um, NOI and value add is 59.4. This value add basically means that if you know that you can raise the rents on five of the units, right? Um, right off the bat, which is not going to be normal because people have leases unless they're on month to month or whatever it is, then what this will do basically is it'll take that increase and put it down to give you a little bit better idea of what your value add would be. 
but let's be conservative and not say any of that. And then, so this tells you what the cap rate, um, what the price is at whatever cap rate is, right? So they're asking 850. So um, they're probably close to a seven cap, right? And we wanna be, well, two things. You wanna be seven and a half cap and above in today's market. What you also wanna see is you wanna see a one and a half to two point spread between the, um, the interest rate that you're gonna be paying for the building and the cap rate that you're gonna be buying it at, right? So right now, interest rates, um, and here, I'll pull this up so you guys can see it. Um, let's see, where is he? All right, so this is, um, Terry Painter owns a very, very large um, uh, loan store is what he basically calls it, but he's been doing this for I think 30 years or something like that. They underwrite um, uh, very well. They close most of their loans. If you need a loan for an apartment building, we don't get any kind of kickback or anything. Um, I just like his product. Um, so if you have an interest, you can reach out to them. It's just apartmentloanstore.com. But these are basically the rates that they're advertising right now. Now, take this with a grain of salt, right? This is probably best case scenario. So in a primary market, um, you know, 75% LTV, um, a B property, um, and you've got a little bit of experience, right? So he has all 30 year amortizations, except obviously for a bridge, uh, which is great because obviously it means that you can spread your payments out a little bit more. LTV is between 75% and 80. Um, in today's environment, I would count more towards the 75% side. And then these are the rates, you know, 4.68 to 6.08. So he's running, if you do the average, he's probably running at about, let's call it 6%, right? Is what he's offering loans for um, for apartment buildings here. And again, you know, everyone's going to be a little bit different, but on average, this is what he's actually loaning money out at. And let's go back here. Where'd it go? There we go. All right. So if you read this part down here, you want to be between a point and a half and two points spread between the cap rate and the interest rate, right? So if the interest rate is um, six or six and a half, right? You wanna be in your cap rate at a seven and a half to eight, right? So if this person's asking 850,000, right? At a seven and a half cap, you could offer 792. Um, in an eight cap, you could offer 750. And at a nine cap, you could offer 660. And we're probably going to want to land somewhere between an eight and a nine cap because what, the way we underwrote it was a six and a half percent interest, right? So six and a half percent interest, if you add two points, is going to be eight and a half. So you want to be right in between here somewhere. So somewhere between 660 and 742. So between almost 80% to 85% of asking, which is reasonable. All right. So you look at this and you go, all right, doesn't mean it's a good deal. Doesn't mean it's a bad deal just means that maybe it's worth my time spending a little bit more time on this property and uh, and really kind of uh, flesh it out a little bit and see if the numbers actually do work. All right, so what you'll do is um, you'll go over here to base info. And again, every spreadsheet is gonna be a little bit different, right? All we're trying to teach you is things to look out for, whether you use our spreadsheet or somebody else's. Um, so up here, and I filled most of this out because I, I don't wanna take up people's time um, I don't want to take up too much of people's time. So here we have 10 units. The average rent um, is $1,000 per month, right? So $10,000. And this is what we saw in the first one, $120,000. We're going to say vacancy rate of 10%, which is 12,000. Other income. One of the things you want to look for in other income is sometimes you'll take over a property and it'll say, you know, I don't know, $10,000 a year in late payments, right? Um, you don't want to count that because if you turn the building around, hopefully most people aren't going to be late, right? So don't take that into account. A lot of people do. I would encourage you not to do so. Now, if they have a laundry facility or something like that, and they say, yeah, our laundry facility on average makes about $5,000 a year, that's fine. You can put it in there. But anything that you think is going to change when you return around the building, please don't put that in there. It's just going to throw your numbers off. 
All right, their current expenses right now are at 53.7 percent or 58,000, so they're a little bit high. Um, but when we do the math, this comes out to our current NOI at $50,000, and the debt service that our strike price was our second is 42, and we may have to adjust it a little bit because for your DCR, you want to be at 1.25 or above. Some people do 1.15. I think in today's market, you're probably going to want to do like 1.25 and above. Um, and for those of you that don't know, DCR is debt coverage ratio. So what it basically says is when you go to a bank, um, they're going to be your biggest partner, right? And understand they're your partner. They're not somebody there that to you know blow your deal up or anything like that. Um, but they have their depositors to make sure they do the right thing for. So when they look at your deal, they're going to look at the risk, right? From a whole bunch of different standpoints, you know, how empty is it? How full is it? Um, you know, how small is it based on your experience? How big is it based on your experience? What do your underwriting numbers look like? So when they look at it, a debt coverage ratio means that, well, let's do it easy, right? So a DCR of one basically means that if I bring in every year, right, after all expenses are paid, $100,000, and my mortgage payment is $100,000, that's a 1% DCR, right? Debt coverage ratio. You bring the money in, you pay the money out, right? They're smart and they've seen people um, you know, make mistakes and their feeling is, you know, I'm not really comfortable with that. What if you know, the roof flies off and you don't have insurance or when your building burns down or you know, 20 people decide they're not gonna pay because the place across the street opened up and they're half the price or whatever it may be. So they would like some sort of cushion and that's what they're asking you for. And I would take this to heart because if a bank comes to you and says no, ask them why, because maybe you've missed something in your right underwriting that they know more about, right? So always ask the reason why. Um, it's kind of like when you do single family homes and you go to a hard money lender, um, you know, their interest, they don't want the property, they want the interest. They wanna make sure that you win 90% of the time, right? So if they say no to you, ask, well, how come? And it's like, well, you know, what you think you'll be able to sell the property at, in my 20 years of experience in this market, you're really going to be at not 285, you're going to be at 250. So these numbers don't work kind of thing. So these people are experts, you know, so take their um, information to heart. Um, and uh, if they say no, find out why and kind of take your, um, uh, take your underwriting and kind of adjust as, um, as you will. So the asking price, we looked back here and it was 850. Our strike price was between, I think we said between eight and nine percent cap rate. So eight and a half is about 700 grand, right? So we're at 82% of what their asking price is. Um, I don't know if you guys have been keeping up, but I've gotten several deals when they send me one. And then two, three, four weeks later, I, I got one today actually that says reduced price, right? So I think some sellers are still under the impression that they can get the kind of money that they got when interest rates were two and a half and 3%. And the numbers just don't pencil out when you're at six and a half or 7% for your interest rate or in Terry's um, uh, website, he says 6%, right? So little by little, they're starting to understand, um, okay, you know, I need to uh, be more realistic about what I'm asking for, for my property. And some owners are going, you know something, I'll just write it out. You know, I'll just wait and the interest rates will go back to two and a half to 3%. Um, I suspect that's not going to happen for a really long time. I don't have a crystal ball, but, uh, you know, stuff you read, like in the journal and stuff like that, they're saying this is going to be going on for a long time and understand before this two and a half to 3%, um, time frame, which we've had, um, most properties when they were bought, the interest rates for most of those were six and a half, seven percent. That's normal, right? This two and a half to three percent is not normal. And when you were buying at six and a half to seven percent interest rate, most properties, like I bought a bunch of mobile home parks, I bought them at a 10 cap, right? So it was not unusual to find 10 caps and nine caps. Um, and that's a little bit harder over the last five years, but now things are starting to change. So it's not unreasonable to try and find a good deal. Again, we're very conservative at an eight and a half cap. You might see some at seven, seven and a half, maybe six and a half, some crazy are still asking for like four, four and a half and stuff like that, which is craziness to me. That's really for the big insurance companies that really don't want an investment. They just want a safe place to put their money and make their four or 5%. Um, but we're looking to make money, right? So when you do this, 
Um, so this is our asking price, right? Your strike price is gonna be here. What your percentage is of what you're gonna be offering is gonna be, you want it to be at least 80% or above of what they're asking for. If you find a deal and they're so overpriced that you can't make it work unless it's less than 80%, I would not put in an LOI. I would just reach out to the broker and go, listen, I pencil this out. And you know, I'm coming in at about 75% of your asking price. Is it worth it for me to even, you know, send something in? Um, and some brokers will go, well, you know, something we're not getting a lot of play, so absolutely send it in. Or some brokers are like, oh, absolutely not. Somebody will show up and buy this. You know, they may not know what they're doing. And you know, James and Nicole will buy it at foreclosure in five years or something like that. But um, you know, sometimes people don't really underwrite conservatively and they buy it. And just as an aside, a lot of people that bought properties in the last couple of years before the interest rates went up, and I'll show you this here in a minute, but when you buy a property and you go to refinance or sell, your price is based on what's called a reversion cap rate, right? So going in, you've got an eight, eight and a half cap rate and going out, you've got an eight or eight and a half cap rate, right? And the deal was supposed to be add like an extra point for these next five years. So if you buy at a three cap rate, then you're gonna be able to make this amount of money because you're selling at a four cap. So all these people that are waiting to refinance or sell that the reversion cap rate was a 4%, when they go to the bank, the banks can go, well, your building's not worth that now because we're at a seven and a half cap. So what you thought was gonna be a $10 million building is now really worth six and a half. So a lot of those guys are panicking. Um, you know, some people have just kind of given the property back. I don't know if you've read about that or not, but some of the big players, like big equity funds and stuff like that, are just walking away from their properties because they can't make the numbers work, which is again why you want to be really, really conservative. So, all right, let's keep going here. I'll be talking all night. All right, so 75% loan to value. You saw in Terry's it could be as high as 80% conservative, 525. So your down payment amount is going to be 175. His interest rates was at six. Ours is going to be at 6.5. His loan term or amortization term is 30 years. We're going to put it at 25 years, right? Conservative all the way along. Because what happens is if you buy that, buy the property at these numbers with this underwriting, and it ends up being you get a loan at 6% with a 30-year amortization, then it's just extra, right? You need to make money almost in a worst case scenario. Um, when you look at these, when you look at deals, um, I know a friend of mine will actually look at deals and go, you know something, I'm looking for a reason to say no. And if I can't receive, find a reason to say no, then I'll move forward on it. So it's a little bit negative, right? I try to be a little bit more optimistic, but kind of take that with a grain of salt. So here's the ability. Um, we entered this because some people get second mortgages. Um, we had one of our students that uh, put an offering on a 24 unit in Dundalk, which is a neighborhood in Baltimore. Um, and the gentleman was willing to take back 50% um, of the note. And so this guy, it's not very normal, but um, this bank, because they knew um, our students, said basically, listen, we'll give you 50% LTV and we'll let you have a second note on the property. Most banks don't do that, but they liked him. Their LTV was 50%, so they went ahead and did it. So for his instance, he put the bank loan up here and then he put the loan to the, um, the owner down here to get his numbers. Right now we're just doing one loan. If you're doing um, an acquisition fee, an acquisition fee is something that you as the general partner in the syndication or the lead partner in a JV collect um, as part of your um, fee for having put the deal together, gone out and looked at 50 deals and all the underwriting, done tours, sat down with investors and stuff like that. You know, all that costs money, right? So the idea between that, behind an acquisition fee is that, you know, I would like to get paid something at closing for all this effort that I put in for putting together this deal. So it's usually 3%. You hear numbers like one to 5%. I have never seen a 5%. On a $40 million project, maybe you'll see 1% or 2% because the amount is so large. But on average, it's about 3%. Closing costs on average are going to be about 3%. And then here you get to decide, okay, the rents in this property are about $175 below market, right? But the market um, properties have maybe slightly nicer flooring. Maybe they've got a, a fan in the living room. 
maybe they got a slightly upgraded bathroom or whatever it is. You have to be able to compare apples to apples, right? So you know that you're charging, or this building is charging $1,000. You know around the corner, they're charging um, $1,175. So what do you have to do to get to $1,175? And in here, I said, okay, well, the stuff we're going to do, you know, I took a contractor through, or I know my numbers pretty well, or the broker told me this is about what I think you're going to end up spending. So we're going to spend $3,500 per unit, revamping a unit. And then if the people want to come back, we'll tell them, look, it's almost like a brand new unit, but the rent's going to be $175 more. Or you can say, you know, I'm sorry that, you know, this is not going to work for you. And then when you release it to somebody else, if you've got a good product, it shouldn't take you very long, then you can rent it at the next rate. Um, so total interior rehab is through. Uh, 35,000, if you have some exterior, like a parking lot or roofs or whatever it is, you would put it in here. Um, we say three months worth of expenses and debt is what you ought to have in your bank account when you start. You can adjust this to whatever you want. You, know, you can adjust it to one month, two months, three months, six months, or whatever it is. Um, as the properties get bigger, you can get, this number will become bigger. So maybe you can get away with like two months or something like that. But again, we're conservative, so we're going to leave in here uh, three months. All right, so our total initial investment, closing, um, acquisition costs, everything else is uh, 100 grand and change. And our total initial investment, which is the down payment plus um, everything else, is 275. And if you're doing a syndication, um, the usual spread is 70 30, right? So on average, the way a lot of these investors are receiving deals is like, to make the numbers work, Mr. and Mrs. Investor, I'm going to give you 70% of all the income. I'll keep 30%, right? Um, and some are like 80-20. I've seen craziness, which is like 90% of the investors and 10%. I'm like, why are you doing this? You're not making any money, right? And I've seen 60-40, and I've seen even 50-50, right? It's all negotiable. You just have to get the numbers to work for you. Um, all right, so your management share is here. So the cap rate at asking, right, is 5.88, which is way too low for us. Cap rate at strike is a little bit less than what we looked at. And the reason it is, is because when you do an analysis just based on price in a SNP test, it's going to tell you you want to be at 8.5%, right? What it doesn't tell you is that you're going to have to have rehab money. You're going to have to have closing costs. You're going to have to have um, acquisition costs. So when you add all that in there, the actual cap rate and brokers, you'll never see this in an offering memorandum, right? So be careful. Um, so when you actually add in all the dollars you actually need, it's going to end up being a 7.14 cap, which is fine, right? As long as we can get it to an eight cap by year two, we're good to go. Year one is always the hardest years. And I always tell my investors, listen, the first year out of the gate, it's not going to be high, right? Um, a lot of investors now are looking for like seven, seven and a half, at least the reasonable ones in terms of cash on cash return. And then anywhere between 15 and 20% for an annualized return after they've been paid everything back when you sell the property. Um, it's not a home run, but it's a single or a double, right? Um, all right, so let's go here. There's acquisition costs, and we'll go through all this stuff. So cash flow. So, all right. So this is where the magic happens, right? So your base potential rent is 120, right? We're gonna say that the rent goes up by 2% every year, right? Be really, really careful here. People have been raising rents 10, 7, 15% over the last couple of years. And I think most renters are tapped out. You know, we can't continue to do that for the same building. If they wanna to move to a nicer building, you know, or you have a nicer uh, unit, that's totally fine. But if you're going to keep raising the rent, you know, if, if the person's rent is $1,000 a month and you don't change anything, but you're going to charge them an extra $150 a month, I don't think that's good business, right? So we are very conservative. We do 2%. Here's that 10% we talked about in terms of vacancy. And so what that gives you is your gross rent. You'll remember this from the first tab is 108. And this is the way um, that I chose to do this, right? I've never seen this in another spreadsheet. Um, other spreadsheets, and even this one, you have to manipulate it a little bit sometimes to get really kind of off the wall scenarios. 
but I really wanted to do was create this so it gives me as strong um, um, an underwriting um, scheme as possible, right? So we know, right, right here, right? What is the value add that we're gonna do? All we do is value add, right? So we're going to, these are all two bedrooms and we're gonna renovate a two bedroom. And when we renovate it, we're gonna charge an extra $175. Now, unless you clear out the entire building, you can't do all of these in one year, right? You're gonna to have to split it up, maybe even over three years. It really depends on what your um, tenancy looks like. But what we did is we said, you know something? We think we can turn these around in the first year, we can do five, and in the second year, we can rehab another five, right? So when you do the math, right, if you raise the rent $175 per unit times five units times 12 months, it comes out to 10.5. Now you'll notice, right, value add renovation per year cumulative. And I'll show you something else as we go on, but this is in year two, right? We don't count this in year one most of the time. The reason being that what if you rehabbed five units in December, right? You would get one month right, worth of income and the real income would not happen until the following year. So you may renovate five units in the first two months and more power to you, just make extra money. But for the most part, we try and be pretty conservative. Um, rubs is basically, if you're paying for the water, you basically um, ask the tenants to basically pay for their a portion of the water. And there's companies that actually do this for you. And that's a separate bill that they get. Um, and you can't overcharge for water. If you're getting charged $10,000 a month of water, you can't split it up and charge 10,500 to your tenants. It has to be less than what you're charging. It can be close, but I usually recommend 70 to 80% of whatever your water bill is. Um, you go ahead and charge back to them. And the same thing, right? We're gonna do five and five in case someone's on lease or whatever it is. We're only gonna do five the first year and we're gonna do five the second year. And then pet fees. Um, it depends on what you want to do. If you want to allow pets, um, you do have to get extra insurance and the extra insurance has limitations on the type of dog and the size of the dog that is allowed. Um, but usually on average, we'll charge an extra $30 a month if someone has a pet, right? But not everybody's going to have a pet. So again, we're going to be conservative and say three of the tenants are going to have pets that we're going to start charging for, right? So uh, you add all this stuff up together, right? And because we're not counting it the first year, we're staying at 108. The second year, well, all this stuff goes into effect, our gross revenue will be at $124,000, right? Our expense dollars, right? We're going to say that we can run this at about 46%, right? 45% usual, but we're a little conservative. So that's about $50,000, right? And here, um, we went down from what they were actually spending on expenses, which is why you see a negative number here. So they were spending whatever it was, 58. We're gonna be spending 50, so it goes down a little bit. But then after that, every year, we're going to raise the expenses, right, by 2%. Every year, the expenses go up all the way across, right? Um, and then you can adjust this any way you want. Um, it could be 45%, or maybe you decide, you know, something's gonna happen in year three, and you need to make this 55% in year three. The, the spreadsheet should really calculate that for you, right? If you're gonna have any kind of um, event like that. Um, so you go all the way down and then um, you've got your reserves, which are $250, which is something that you put aside for a what if as time goes on. So your NOI here is uh, $55,000. Your cap rate in the first year, right? is 7.93, your debt service is 42,000, your cash flow is 12,000, your cash on cash return is very low because remember, you're not counting any of this money the first year. It will be higher than this, but again, you wanna be conservative when you pitch this and say, listen, year one, your rate, your 70% is gonna be about three and a half percent. Most sophisticated investors understand that, right? They understand the first year is always the worst, right? Um, but then as time goes on, right? It goes up to 5.7, 7.7, 8.0, 8.7. So when you do all the math and you come back to the base info, 
right? Their return on an annualized basis, the checks they're getting is almost six and three quarter percent when you average it out over five years. All right, we'll get through this here in a couple minutes. All right, your exit strategy, right? You can refinance, which is what we try and do. We try and refinance, pay everybody back if we can, and then keep the building for ourselves. Or if the amount is too large, some people want to stay in, right? They want their investment money back, but they want to stay in the deal. So what they do is, okay, I got my 100 grand back, right? I've got $50,000 worth of equity. I'm going to leave it in there and just make interest on that. And a lot of people do that. Um, or sometimes you just replace an investor with another investor, whatever it is. So this gives you the option in terms of how to do that. In this example, we're just going to use um, a complete sale, right? So in this example, again, well, here, let me show you something, right? So this is 8% cap rate, right? So the exit price after we've done our value add is $957,000. So let's say um, you're going to be aggressive and say, well, I think the interest rates are going to come down and the cap rate is going to be 7%, right? So remember, it's 957, right? It's gone up by $150,000, so almost 15%. Or if you do six, all of a sudden, this is worth $1.3 million from 954. So be careful when you do this. Again, be conservative. The remaining bank loan is 475. The profit is $481,000. The investor loan was 275. So the profit after the investor loan payoff is 206. And the cost percentage, when you get into the bigger deals, it's usually about 3%. It usually doesn't go over $250,000. But some of the smaller deals, it's going to be 5 or 6%. Obviously, that's negotiable. So those are your sales costs. The deal net profit, 158. And the capital sale, so the, um, the investors get 111. But when you add in all of the cash they put in, um, their equity and their cash flow, they make $202,000. So um, I'm already at five after seven. So um, I'm going to stop it there. But the idea is it's a lot of numbers, right? Um, it takes a little bit of practice. Um, but the way that we teach is we actually teach it on paper first, which seems like overkill, right? But the reason we do that is because when you get here, and you look at your base info and go, oh my gosh, you know, that's a 32% return on my money. You're gonna know that it's something's wrong, right? Somewhere in your competition, in your uh, computation or something like that, you did something wrong, or if your expenses are 80% or whatever it is. Um, but the idea behind this spreadsheet or any spreadsheet is to make it easier for you so you don't spend three hours like I did a long time ago underwriting projects. Um, you can take maybe about an hour underwriting and then you can kind of play with it, you know, a little bit. So if you decide, you know, something, um, I don't think I can get it for 700. I think I can get it for 750 or I got a better deal. I can get it for 650 or whatever it may be. You can play around everything in yellow. You can play around with, right? And then the blue will actually kick out the formulas for you. So, all right. So I've been talking nonstop for 30 minutes. So, um, anybody have any questions about this or anything else? Let me stop sharing. Uh, everybody in here? So I either put you all to sleep or it's too confusing or I did an amazing job and totally explained it 100%. So I don't know which one it is. Amazing job. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Jane. <laughs> did you understand it? Even for a right brainer. <laughs> well thank you for that so and you know it's again it's like anything else right it's a skill um the, the nice thing about multifamily um versus single family you can be incredibly successful in single family like jane and sharon are incredibly successful um maybe i'm just not that bright but for me i want to see the numbers Right. And sometimes when you do a single family, if you're going to flip it or something like that, right, um, you say, well, I think my after repair value is going to be 275 based on the houses in the area. Right. And then what happens is you start your rehab and all of a sudden interest rates go up and people can't afford as much. So what you thought you were going to be able to say is sell for 275. Now you can only sell for 250 or 240. Right. Um, with, with multifamily is much more structured on just the numbers. So it's easier for me. 
Now, Jane and Sharon, they are super conservative as well. Um, so I know that even if the interest rates went up or whatever it is, they would still do fine, but they go into it with a very conservative mindset. And that's what I appreciate about them, that they're just like us. They're just very, very conservative. Any other questions? Hey, Ferd, good to see you, man. I haven't seen you in a while. And Song, good to see you too. Hey, James. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm not on. Sorry, I'm not on camera today. I'm multitasking. Thank you for the overview. And I joined maybe one or two minutes late, but is it? And you may have mentioned this earlier. Are you able to share that spreadsheet? I like to kind of go into each cell and like dig into the numbers. Right. Are you able to sh share that? Um, unfortunately, not. Um, the students get this, um, but you know, it took a really long time to put this together. So unfortunately, unless you're a student. Um, we don't share it. It's just something that we've chosen to do. Um, Nicole has chosen not to do that. So I'm sorry, but you'd have to be a student to actually get this version. Now you can get other versions on the web and stuff like that. Yep. Um, well, you don't have to be a student, um, but just this is the one that we like and, and this is the one we've used and we've been pretty successful. Got it. No, that's totally understandable. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Good talking to you the other day, by the way. I enjoyed it. Thank you, me too. Hey, James. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry that I was on mute. Uh, can you hear me now? I can absolutely hear you. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, it's been a while. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, going through uh, the spreadsheet, I've seen some spreadsheet where they have scenarios. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and for yours, I did not see any scenarios where by, you know, you comparing other properties you know, so, so if it, if it's something that you intentionally left it out, is it uh you? I mean, just let us know why, and uh, right. also if it makes sense to have scenarios in it. Right. So, um, it's something we've thought about. I know which spreadsheet you're talking about, and that's the same spreadsheet that I went to the conference, and the guy up front got one answer, and everybody around the table got a, a different answer. <laughs> so, um. Um, it's almost overly complex, and a lot of the uh, formulas are not protected, so you can go in there and change them, but what happens is you change it, and then you go change something else, and you forgot it, so I like the idea. Um, I can do the same thing by just manipulating the numbers. Um, I like the idea of the different scenarios. Um, I just think that it's very hard to provide that and do it accurately. Um, you know, it's been like a year since, you know, I saw this thing. So maybe he's changed it since then. Um, I, I was just not a big fan. Yeah, thank, thank you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Anybody else, Charlene, you have any questions? Um, oh, okay, for right now, what's the student? Is there, are there different prices for the student fee or or is it one set price or um because remember when I asked you about the mentorship and you said give you a call about that right and I totally forgot I've got it written down I apologize for that I'll give you a call about that tomorrow but uh, the class is two thousand dollars and you can break it up over three payments and it's a hundred percent money back guaranteed if you know after 30 days you're like oh wow you know something this isn't for me or whatever it is we'll give you your money back no questions asked um we have had one person do that in the entire time we've had this program um and it was a very sad situation somebody in his family died he had to back out and stuff like that so you know you do the right thing it was over the 30 days we wanted to do the right thing by the person um so yeah you just go to passivecashflowforlife.com you can sign up there um and then we're, well, we've been told to raise the price, which we're not comfortable doing right now. Um, a while ago, it was like 997 and now it's 2000. So we did raise the price about seven or eight months ago, um, just to kind of keep track uh, or keep up with the market. Got it. Hey, James. Hey, Song. Um, do you have any deals in Maryland or Jersey right now, three units and above that are decent deals? I have a buyer, a retail buyer that is interested. Um, 
off the top of my head, I don't have anything. I mean, I get stuff all the time, just like I'm sure you do. Um, I mean, it's going to be three units and below. Um, above, above. Above, okay, three units and above. Like, how far up are they going to go? Um, I don't know the, like, the full details. I just, they, they just told me that initially. Okay. Um, probably not that much above, maybe okay. 20. So most of these deals you're going to have, you're going to find on the MLS, you know, five, six units and below, you're going to find the MLS. I've seen stuff as high as 10, 11 units. We actually found on the MLS that we actually underwrote and almost bought for 82 units, which is an anomaly, right? Those just aren't on the MLS. It was just the guy didn't know anybody. He knew his realtor that he bought his house from. So she listed it on the MLS and then somebody called us. But um, the MLS is probably your best um, um, bet for that. I know you have access um, in Maryland. You also have access in New Jersey? Um, I think I do. I have to double check. Okay. Yeah. So that would be the best bet. I mean, if you wanted to, you could reach out to some of the smaller brokers and see what they have. Um, you know, Marcus and Millichap and those guys are probably not going to have something that small. Um, what you can also do is you can go to uh, LoopNet, which I know is like where all the deals go to die, right? Um, I've actually had somebody buy a deal on LoopNet and did really well, but that, again, another anomaly. Um, but when you go on LoopNet, you can find a lot smaller deals, and the deals are probably not going to be very good deals. What we can do is you can look up the broker, maybe someone's in central Jersey that has a 10 unit or something like that. You can reach out to them and say, hey, I saw you on LoopNet. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking more for between a three and a five unit. What else do you have? Or if you don't have something, you're asking, please send me something when you do have it and, um, and kind of um, expand your network of brokers that way. Um, because some commercial brokers will list smaller stuff. It's not very usual. And again, most of those go on the MLS but it's another um, avenue for you to pursue. Um, and you know how it is, right? I mean, you've got to be calling these brokers, you know, once a month or sending them an email, just dropping in, just to let them know that you're serious. You're not just a tire kicker. It's kind of building that relationship. Um, so make sure you do that. But those are the best things, MLS, and then go to LoopNet and find some smaller brokers, or you can just Google, you know, brokers and try and find some small ones for your zip code. Thank you. Uh -huh, sure. And I will, and I'll, I'm going to call you about the other appointment. Yeah, um, sure, no they, problem. Been busy. Well, okay. thank you, James. All right, no problem. Thank you. Hey, James. <clears throat> hey, Jason. How you doing? Good. How are you? Pretty good. Thanks for having me, by the way. I'm a little bit late. It's my first time joining the Zoom. Mm -hmm. So, um, actually, I caught a video like close to the end. Mm -hmm. But I realized that you didn't, you know, your underwriting did not reflect the AAR or the IRR. I could have missed it. I know it did reflect the COC, but um, I didn't see it. No, it does have it. It's just further down. It's just when you start to get into IRR and stuff like that, it uh -huh. gets a little more complicated. And there just wasn't enough time on this kind of presentation to go through it. But yeah, it does have it. Okay. Um, but you, you want to tell me what IRR is? What, what? Do you want to tell people what IRR is? That's the internal rate of return. Okay. And, and why, why do people use it? Well, I'm still getting into the, because well, the, what I've actually realized more so about the premise behind underwriting any multifamily asset that those are the three main thing an investor look for. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people talk about cap rate, NOI, but these are the most, especially if it's like a syndication deal. Right. Um, they look for the COC, the AAR, the IRR. Right. And that is to pretty much help with the disbursement or payment of how each syndication investors are being paid. If I, You can't correct me if I'm wrong. Right. So when you underwrite, you're underwriting um, as the person putting the deal together. And then correct. when you present it to investors, you're absolutely right. Cash on cash return. Um, annualized return and then internal rate of return. Um, for those of you that are, that are not aware, um, internal rate of return basically takes into account the cost of money, right? So the idea, and this is perfect because two years ago, you could go into uh, Giant or Safeway and buy X for $10, right? You go into Safeway or Giant now and that same thing um, now costs you $13. Right. right. So the value of money has gone down. So the longer you have money out, right, the 
when the money comes back, it's not worth as much, right? So kind of the same example, if, if, you, if I give you my money, if I give you hundred grand to buy a deal today, right? Or two years ago, right? When everything was $10. So when I get that money back in three years or five years, whenever it is, stuff is more expensive. So that money's not worth as much to me. So that's what the internal rate of return takes into account. Now you have to be careful because sometimes people will put in a refinance on an internal rate of return and excuse the number. Um, internal rate of return is also, um, it's not always 100% accurate. It depends on which formula you use. And the best way to use it really, at least in my mind, is that, okay, I've got two deals, right? They both are gonna give me 7% cash on cash. They're gonna give me 15% when everything's said and done. The IRR on one is you know, 16%. The IRR on the other one is 6%. Well, I'm going to take the one with the 16% IRR because I know I'm going to get my money back faster, right? So the general rule in finance is if you're lending money out, you want to get it back as fast as you can, right? Mm -hmm. If you're borrowing money, uh, so I'm sorry, the reverse. So if you're lending money out, you want to keep it out as long as you can, right? And if you're going to um, bring money in or lend money or uh, borrow money, you want to keep it as long as you can. Because if you're making $1,000 a month payments today, in 20 years, that $1,000 is really only like $700, right? Or $600 or $500. So you're mm -hmm. paying back with dollars from 20 years from now, which are worth less. So hopefully everything else in your life has gone up, rents have gone up, everything else has gone up and stuff like that. So you're making more money. So that same $1,000 isn't as expensive for you as it was when you first started. Does that make sense? A lot of sense. Thanks for that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, sure. Is there any way, though, John, we could actually get a replay of this, being that I was late? Um, I really like the way how you break it down, like you simplify it. And, um... Sure. So what happens is, um, and I'll put it in the chat so you guys can get it. So um, RVA um, on Wednesday or Thursday, they will actually go to, um, uh, they'll edit the videos and they'll cut them up and they'll actually put them up on our YouTube channel. And um, here's the YouTube channel. Um, and where is chat? Chat, 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 chat. Um, all right, so um, you would just click on that, cut and paste it or whatever it is that works for you and then look for it on Thursday. And what we're trying to do is we started a playlist just for Teaching Tuesdays. We've only got a couple in there. So the rest of them are just mixed in with everything else. And what we're gonna do is over the next week or so, we're gonna have her actually take all the Teaching Tuesdays and move them over into a playlist. And then you can just watch one at a time, you know, all the way through. So it makes it easier for you guys. But yeah, that's that's the, um, uh, the YouTube channel. And there's a lot of other stuff on there too. Everything we've been doing since January is up there as well. So lots of different uh, information. Thank you. Charlene, I'm taking your number down right now. Hey, James, quick question, just uh, unrelated to that, but why is it that LoopNet has said the where deals go to die? What What is that about? I've heard that <laughs> this 2016, but. So the way that, that most um, brokers work, right, <clears throat> is they'll get a deal and they'll go, wow, this is a really good deal. Let me see what I have on my list, right? So they'll send it out to their list and then nobody on their list wants it. And so then what they'll do is they'll send it out to um, other brokers in the same office. Hey, do you have somebody? Do you have somebody? Do you have somebody, right? Nobody in the office has that. And then they may share it with brokers in other offices, right? And everyone's like, no, that's a bad deal. I don't want it. So kind of as a um, Hail Mary pass, they'll go, well, we'll just put it on LoopNet and some sucker will come along <laughs> and buy it. And, and it just sits there you know, for a long time. Um, sometimes some of the smaller brokers will put stuff up there right away or owners that want to do sale by owner will put stuff up there. So it can be a decent resource, but don't expect to go there and find lots of good deals. Um, you need to get on a broker's list and have them send them to you. That's the best way to find deals. Um, but it doesn't hurt to go in there once a week, once every couple of weeks or something like that. Crexy's kind of the same way. Um, they don't have quite the rep that LoopNet does. You can actually find some pretty decent deals on Crexy because it's more... I guess modern, 
Um, and you can just sign up for whatever you want on either one of those. You know, I want to see everything in Maryland between five units and 100 units, between this price and that price, and then just set up an agent. And then every time something comes up, it'll send you an email saying, hey, here's five deals that we found for you based on your um, parameters. But yeah, that's why it's, they go to die. So that's been around for a long gotcha. time. <laughs> gotcha. But I guess it's a good way to find a broker, right? Yeah. We found brokers that way. Absolutely. When we look at a market that we're interested in, we'll go in there and search for properties underneath that zip code. Um, and then we'll pull five, six brokers, whoever's in that area, and we'll reach out to all of them. And sometimes you get better deals with smaller brokers. You know, Marcus and Millerchap has, has had the reputation for a long time that it's awesome to sell through them, but it's not so good to buy through them because they're really asked top dollar for everything. Um, but not all the brokerages are like that. Marcus and Millichap, um, and I haven't talked to them in a couple of years, so I'm not sure if that still is their rep, but it was for a while. Um, but if you're starting off, you know, um, you can go to the big ones if you want and just get on their list. Um, but the smaller ones, finding them through LoopNet is sometimes a really, really good, uh, really good deal. Actually, that 82 unit that we found in South Carolina, um, <clears throat> we found it that somebody that was down there that knew us, um, I guess they put it on the MLS um, and they were about to put it on LoopNet, which is how he found out about it. And then he just sent it to us. So you never know. You know, sometimes you find good deals. So. Hi, Hi Sharon. Hello, hello. How are you? Hey. I was over on the other side. I figure I better pop my face on. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we're getting close to, to 730. So I'm getting ready to, to hand this off to uh, Jane and Sharon, who are our partners in the single family space. Um, they used to live up here where we are in Maryland, and then they got smart and they moved down to Florida, where it's super nice, except maybe in August. I don't know. Is it still really nice down there in August or is it too hot? It's actually cooling off a little bit. So it, it's been nice this week. Still a little hot, but not as bad as Texas. So it's okay. all good. <laughs> so they joined the big exodus. Everyone's moving to Florida, right? Um, so that's awesome. So anyway, they've been phenomenal. They've been doing this, I think, since 2016. They've got almost 200 deals under their belt, 170 or something like that, I think. Does that sound right? Mm, about 150, maybe. 150? Okay, my mistake. So that's still a lot of deals, right? So um, they've got tremendous um, knowledge, um, and they have brought a guest speaker today. Is that right? Yes, hopefully. Okay. Is she is she on? We don't see her yet. Okay. Anita. Uh, nope, I don't see her yet, so... Um, all right, so I'm just going to turn it over to uh, to you guys. Okay. Well, I'm uh, going to man the computer.